Hello and welcome to English 203, Introduction to Literary Study. I'll be your instructor, Dr. Sam Lackey, and this is the week one lecture. So let's go ahead and get started. So in this class, we're going to be learning a lot about literature, what it is, how to identify it, but more importantly, we're going to be learning some strategies and techniques for analyzing literature. That's ultimately what we want to do. We want to arrive at our own original interpretations of the text that we read this semester. So what is literature? Uh, most of us probably have some idea. We might already have an answer in mind, but if you check out the week one module in Web Campus, you'll notice that I've posted our first reading assignment. It's just a short chapter from an old textbook. Now, as you probably know, we don't have a required textbook for this class. Um, I will be posting all the readings throughout the semester in Web Campus. But I want you to check out that chapter because it's kind of an introduction to what we're doing. And it wrestles with this question of what is literature? How do we define it? How do we identify it? So most of us have some experience working with literature in the past, maybe in English 101, maybe in previous English classes that we took in high school. So we typically think about novels, short stories, poetry or drama, you know, stage plays, when we think about literature. Those are some of the traditional categories. But nowadays, we're kind of expanding the definition a little bit. So that chapter that we're reading here in week one asks us, uh, well, first it tells us that literature is a notoriously difficult term to define. But then they raise the possibility that we might consider almost any form of written expression to be literature. We might consider almost any written text to have at least certain elements or qualities that are often found in literature. But typically, traditionally, we make a distinction between what we might consider to be artistic texts, like novels, like poetry, on one hand, versus other non-artistic texts, on the other hand. So things like newspapers, or legal documents, or obituaries, uh, instruction manuals, or even text messages. Those are all forms of written expression. But we can see that some of those texts are created uh, and designed to be art. Uh, they are intended to function artistically. They're supposed to be enjoyable or illuminating in some way. Whereas the other types of text might still be enjoyable. They're certainly useful and practical, especially if we're thinking about stuff like newspapers or instructions or even text messages. Those might not be artistic, but they're still written expression and they still do things. Uh, they help us to accomplish certain goals. So we used to have a pretty uh, strong line separating the artistic texts from the non-artistic texts. But now we're starting to kind of expand our ideas about what literature can be. And we're noticing that often with newspapers, maybe even with text messages or other types of written expression that we might see on social media, there are literary elements at work in those texts. So one of the things we're going to be doing throughout the semester is sort of continuing to return to this question and sort of opening up the definition of literature. We're going to cover the traditional types of literature. That begins next week and week two. So we are going to cover those traditional categories that I named earlier, but we're also going to think about other things like movies, like graphic novels or comics. There are a lot of other texts that can be classified as artistic, uh, but they might not fit into those traditional categories or definitions. So we're going to kind of, you know, explore this question a little bit more. And we might even think about non-written texts as potentially functioning in a lot of the same ways as literature. So uh, if you take a look at our modules in Web Campus, you'll notice one of the... Uh, 
assignment types that we do in here is something called the alternative media. Uh, so we're going to have several alternative media assignments throughout the semester, and that's a chance for you to apply some of these things that we're learning about literature. The, you know, the key elements, some of the important characteristics of literature that we're going to be learning, you can apply that stuff to other types of texts, things that might not usually be thought of as literary or artistic, but we can certainly make the case that they are. So that's one thing that we'll be doing throughout this semester. But like I said, we're going to still learn about the traditional categories, the traditional types of literature. We're going to learn all about sort of how they work, and we're going to be looking at examples of each type. We're also going to be learning a little bit about the history of literature, and we're going to be looking at literary criticism and theory. These are basically tools that we can use to help us analyze literature. So we're going to be covering all of that, but here in week one, I just want to talk a little bit about Web Campus, encourage you to look at the syllabus, and I'll talk about some of our major assignments and kind of our first big move that we need to make here in week one is to talk about some key literary elements. Uh, and I want you guys to take a look at that chapter that I posted just so you can think more about what the word literature means. Uh, where does the word come from? You know, what is it connected to? And I just want us to start thinking more about texts, all different kinds of texts, but certainly the traditional literary texts, as, along with some other texts that we might also be able to consider as literature. So uh, just a few quick words about the class in general. Obviously, this is an online class. So everything that you need each week will be posted to Web Campus in our weekly modules. So for us, uh, a, a new week begins on M Monday morning. That's when I post all of the weekly material. So the reading assignments for that week, uh, my weekly lectures, everything else that you need for the week will be published first thing Monday morning. That's when our week begins. And you have the entire week to complete all of our work for that week. Any assignments that might be due that week are going to be due at the end of the week. And for us, that means Sunday night at 11.59 p.m. So I want you guys to get into the habit of thinking about the week in those terms. The week begins on Monday morning. I post everything. And then you have until Sunday night to get everything done. That means complete the reading and submit whatever assignment might be due. So it's okay if you're not checking the module first thing on Monday morning. I understand we have other things to do. We have other classes, other obligations, but make sure that you check out the week's module pretty early in the week. So if not Monday, at least by Tuesday, watch my lecture, complete the reading, and do whatever work is assigned. And if you ever have any questions about an assignment or if I forget to post something, if something appears to be missing in that week's module, just email me. Of course, in an online class, email is the best way for us to communicate. Uh, here at the beginning of the semester, it's a good idea to take a look at the syllabus. I've made that available in the week one module. It's just a Word document. Open it up. Take a look at it. You might want to save it or download it or even print it out so you have it for the rest of the semester. I don't expect you guys to read the syllabus word for word, but of course you can check out all of my policies. You can look at all of the assignments. They're all listed there. Uh, you can also click on the assignments tab in Web Campus once you get into our class and you'll be able to see all of the assignments there as well. But I provide descriptions in the syllabus. Uh, you'll see the grading scale. And like I said, all of my policies pertaining to late work and just basic class rules. But the most important thing uh, contained within the syllabus is a detailed course schedule. 
And that's the thing that I want you to look at above all else. That begins kind of near the end of the syllabus, and it's a way for you to kind of look ahead because I only publish the modules one week at a time. I don't want people to get overwhelmed, but if you want to work ahead or if you just want to know what's coming up in the future, take a look at the detailed class schedule inside the syllabus. So I tell you what we are doing each week of the semester. So I'm telling you what we're reading, what work is due, and what we are covering. So that schedule is complete. It takes us all the way to the end of the semester. And you can take a look at it just to get a feel for what we're doing over the course of the semester. So if you have any questions about the syllabus or anything else in Web Campus, email me. I strongly encourage you guys to stay in touch with me, communicate with me. I know this is not a typical live class where we see each other and we can interact in that normal way, but it is important that we communicate. I'll be sending emails periodically to you guys, so you need to check those. Uh, always check Web Campus, and if you ever have questions or problems, get in touch with me. I do not mind answering questions. I like questions. I like to communicate with all of my students, so uh, just get into the habit of doing that. And you know, just a couple of quick things. We do have discussion posts on almost a weekly basis in this class. So that's our most common assignment. That's what we do the most often. So we're normally responding to what we've read in our discussion posts. So that will frequently mean that we're actually reading literature and we're responding to that literature. But on other weeks, I might post textbook chapters like I did this week. So remember, we don't have any required books in this class. I post all of the readings to Web Campus for free. Uh, they'll, they'll often be in the form of PDF files. In other cases, I'll give you links to websites where you'll be able to complete the reading. So you don't have to spend any money in this class, but we are reading in this class. Don't be confused. Just because we don't have a book does not mean that reading is not a big part of this class. It very much is. If we're going to learn about literature, if we're going to get more comfortable with literature, we have to read. Uh, so this class emphasizes reading and writing, just like most other English classes that exist in the world. We have to do both. And those discussion posts are designed to be informal. Uh, they're opportunities for you to respond to what you've read, share your opinions, but you can also read what your classmates have to say. You can, you can also respond to your classmates. So since we're not meeting in a live setting, the discussion board is an opportunity to kind of create a sense of community. We can talk to one another. We can exchange ideas. We can debate. You might be able to learn a little bit from your classmates. And every once in a while, I might comment on the discussion board as well. But each week, I'll give you a couple of specific discussion questions or prompts that I want you to answer. And mostly, I leave it up to you guys. I like the discussion board to be a, a student space. I don't really like to get too involved. I want you guys to share your opinions. You can ask questions, and you can talk to each other. So we'll be doing those most weeks. Uh, every once in a while, if we have a major assignment due in a particular week, I might give you a break from the discussion board. But typically, you will have a discussion post due at the end of each week. Now, here in week one, we're starting kind of uh, in, a, in an easy way. Our first discussion post is simply introducing yourself. I would like us to get to know each other at least a little bit, and I would just like to know a little bit more about each of your backgrounds. You know, how old are you? What grade are you in? What are your interests? What do you like to read? Uh, what are you, uh, wh what major are you in? Why are you at GBC? What are you working on? What do you hope to accomplish here in college? So just really basic stuff, very informal, obviously includes your name 
and a few other key pieces of info. And that's all we're doing for our first discussion post. But starting in week two, you'll need to start, you know, doing some more heavy lifting. But I keep those informal and I don't grade for grammar, mechanics or anything like that. Like again, they're informal. But we're going to have larger assignments too. So I've mentioned the alternative media assignments. We're going to have maybe five of those, I think, over the course of the semester. Think of those as little mini essays. They need to be formal. They need to be in Word docs or PDFs and then submitted uh, at the end of whatever week they're due. They're going to be more polished, a little bit more extensive, and a lot more thoughtful, perhaps, or just a little more effort will be involved compared to the discussion uh, post. So we'll have a handful of alternative medias. We're also going to have a couple of critical responses. So those are also kind of like short essays, and they're getting us ready for our final assignment, the big argumentative research paper at the end of the semester. So the critical responses are kind of practice, but again, they need to be formal. They need to be formatted properly according to MLA guidelines. We'll talk about that later. Uh, they need to be pretty extensive, pretty detailed, and I need to see that you're actually conducting analysis. Remember, that's one of our key areas of focus here. We're learning how to analyze literature how to arrive at our own original interpretations. So the alternative media, that gets you a chance to talk about comics or you know TV shows, movies, music, video games, stuff that you guys like and, and might pursue in your free time. But the critical responses will require you to work with the traditional categories of literature. Short stories, poems, plays, the old school stuff. We have to get comfortable analyzing that stuff as well. And then, of course, that's what we're doing on a much larger scale with our final paper. And if you remember 102, uh, the final paper in this class is somewhat similar. It is an argumentative research paper. That means it will require research, uh, but you are advancing an original interpretation of one of our literary texts. And it's going to be extensive, detailed, full of original ideas and outside sources. So of course, we'll have plenty of time to work on that. So again, it's like the 102 paper, except now it's about literature. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, so I just wanted to talk about a few things that we see in the week one reading. Uh, and then I'll talk about some key literary elements that we need to get comfortable with here in week one because we're going to be using them throughout the semester. So, like I said, take a look at that chapter I posted. They talk about the meaning of the word literature and different ways to kind of look at it. But there are a few terms that I just wanted to go over, some terms that are mentioned in that chapter. The first one being text type. So I've already kind of talked about this, but this is actually a term from the field of linguistics that's usually referring to non-literary texts. And I've already given you some examples, newspapers, instruction manuals, obituaries, advertisements, text messages. We would typically call these text types because they're not literature, but they are text. They are written expression. But we don't usually think about them as being artistic, but maybe we should, maybe we can. So part of the fun in this class is we can sometimes take a text type and maybe treat it like a work of literature, or we can at least see some similarities between these two categories that have traditionally been kept apart. Another term they mentioned that I'm going to be mentioning throughout the semester is discourse. Discourse means any type of classifiable expression. It can be written or spoken that and it contains some kind of thematic or structural material. So different kinds of discourse surround us. Uh, we are surrounded by discourse. Sometimes it takes written form. Other times it's just 
spoken. So we can think about discourse as any kind of expression, any kind of ideas that are floating around, maybe on the internet, things that people are talking about, things that are being discussed on TV or perhaps in the movies. It is being written about, but it's also being talked about. So there's all these different elements to consider with discourse, but we often pick up different pieces of discourse just in our everyday lives. We hear people talking, we turn on the news, or we flip on a movie or a TV show that might be dealing with some of those same ideas. So this is just kind of stuff that's in the atmosphere. Uh, it's just all around us. These are ideas or expressions that are important in our culture right now in the present moment so we'll talk a lot more about that term as we go along and then also remember the differences between primary sources and secondary sources primary sources are artistic objects <laughs> they are the objects of analysis for us in this class so what that usually means is these are works of literature uh, so when we're looking at examples of the traditional types of lit, I'm going to give you examples of short stories, examples of poems, examples of plays. Those are primary sources. Those are artistic objects that we can analyze. And we will be analyzing them throughout the semester. And then on the other hand, we have secondary sources. These are scholarly or critical treatments of the primary sources. So secondary sources are the articles, the essays, and the books that are written about the works of art. So typically scholars, academics, uh, people like me are, are writing essays and books that analyze novels, short stories, poems, and plays. So later in the semester when we start doing research, for our own papers, we're going to be finding secondary sources. We're going to be finding things written by critics and scholars that attempt to analyze, summarize, and interpret these primary objects, these primary sources, these works of art, these works of literature. So just keep those terms in mind. We're going to be returning to them uh, throughout the semester. And eventually, like I said, you'll need to find secondary sources on your own to help you analyze the primary sources that I give you in Web Campus. All right. So the final thing I want to do today is just talk a little bit about literary elements. These are really the building blocks of literary analysis. And yeah, we have a lot of other tools that we can use to help us analyze. We're going to learn about different schools of criticism and theory that we can use. We're going to be using secondary sources, like I just said. But at the very beginning, when we first start our analytical journey in this class, the, the, the primary tool that we're going to have will be literary elements. These are just key characteristics of literature, the things that we often find in literature. And these are things that we can always analyze, think about, discuss in more detail. And remember what analyzing means. When you analyze something, you break it down in order to understand and demonstrate how it works. You can analyze almost anything under the sun, mechanical objects, <laughs> sports, uh, whatever you like. You can analyze any kind of written text, whether it's literature or not. Obviously, our focus will be analyzing literature. But a key thing about analysis is you're breaking something down and looking at all of its individual parts in order to better understand how that thing works as a whole. So when you're doing that, you're going to be looking at specific literary elements because they're like the individual parts, the individual components of the larger text, the larger work of literature. So a lot of these elements should be familiar to you. You have probably heard about them, used them in previous classes. So this is kind of review 
but I might be adding a few new elements that you're not as familiar with. So let's just run through these quickly. Some of these elements are going to show up mostly in fiction. Uh, and fiction for us just means novels, short stories, and ancient epics. I'll explain how those are all connected next week when we start working on fiction. Uh, so certain elements mostly show up in fiction. Other elements are going to be more common to poetry. And then certain elements are going to show up in drama as well. But some will show up in all types of literature. No matter what we're reading, we're going to see at least some of these key elements. So it's important to get comfortable with them uh, and make sure you understand the definition of each one. So let's start with setting. Most of us know this one. Uh, this simply refers to the location. You know, where do the events of this text take place? Where are we? Uh, so remember with setting, there's really two levels. We can think about physical setting, and that means like geography. Where in the world are we? What country? What state? What city? Are we in somebody's house? Are we in a restaurant? Are we in a car driving down the road? Where are we physically? That's one level. And then the other level is temporal. That just means dealing with time. So what time period are we in? We also need to be clear about that. Uh, does this work of literature take place in the present day? Does it take place in the past? in some previous historical period, or if it's science fiction or fantasy, it might take place in the future. So we need to be clear on time and our physical location. Those are both important when considering the setting. All right, next up we have plot. I think most of us know what a plot is. If you've ever watched a TV show or a movie or if you've read anything, even a newspaper article kind of has a plot. And certainly almost any work of fiction, short story, epic, novel, they all have plots as well. So a plot is simply the sequence of events in a narrative. A narrative is just a story. So most works of literature will tell narratives. But again, this is where uh, defining gets tricky because we can't say that narrative is only found in literature because newspaper articles also have narratives. Uh, other types, of, you know, other text types, other non-literary forms of text can also tell stories. You know, a lot of long text messages might be providing a narrative. Um, so narrative shows up in all kinds of places and wh wherever there's a narrative or a story, it can be fictional or true. Uh, a lot of the elements remain the same and wh wherever we find a narrative, we're going to find a plot, the sequence of events. How does that sequence unfold? Uh, does it follow a chronological order? Meaning we move from the beginning to the end, the earliest event, all the way up to the most recent? Or is the sequence mixed up and jumbled in some way? Do we start in the middle uh, of, the, of, of the plot? Do we actually start at the end and work our way back? So we need to think about all of that stuff and next week, when we start talking about fiction, I'll show you guys the classic uh, plot triangle. And we'll talk about the, the traditional stages of plots. But that's not always operative. We don't always see all the different stages of the triangle. But it's good to be familiar with that model just so we know what we're looking for and what we see. And in some cases, what we don't see. But we're pretty familiar with plot. Also, character. I think most of us know what characters are. These are the people who occupy uh, the fictional world that we are in. These are the people that inhabit the text. But again, non-literary texts also have characters. I go back to the newspaper articles, right? Any kind of news, no matter where you get your news, they have characters, 
Except in that case, the characters will probably be real people. Although real people also sometimes show up in works of fiction. Uh, but obviously with any kind of narrative, whether it's fiction or real, we're going to have characters. And we can have a wide range of different kinds of characters. So typically the protagonist is the main character. The person that we sort of identify with, the person that we follow, the person that we know the most about in the narrative. But remember, the protagonist is not always necessarily the hero. That is the case with some narratives, but not always. And then we'll have an antagonist. That's the person or thing that's kind of getting in the way of what the protagonist wants. So the antagonist doesn't necessarily have to be a bad guy, but in some cases, that is the case. Uh, so we'll talk more about those character types. Also, some characters are round and dynamic, which means they're kind of three-dimensional, they have a lot of complexity, and they might grow and change over the course of the narrative. And then in other cases, we might have flat, static characters which means they really don't grow or change um, and they're not uh, as complex as maybe real people. <laughs> Sometimes flat, static characters are meant to represent types of people. They're not really meant to be realistic portraits of actual people. They kind of have a symbolic value where they represent a certain type of person or a certain category of person. So we'll talk more about that next week. Also, think about structure a little bit. This might be an element that you haven't dealt with as much. Structure is all about form and formula. So you might not think about formulas when you think about literature or English, but a lot of literature follows very specific structures. Uh, that are based on certain rules and certain formulas. We're definitely going to see that with poetry. Uh, but we might also see it with fiction and drama. So we have to be sort of tuned in to the structure of a work. How is it designed? How is it built? We're going to be thinking more about that. So this can really function in a lot of different ways. When we're talking about fiction, we can talk about different genres of fiction. Uh, like horror movies or, you know, the horror genre in general. And you might find that within that genre, there's a certain structure that a lot of horror movies or, you know, works of literature follow. Maybe it's, a, it, it's the way the plot works, or maybe it's the types of characters that we see, or maybe it's the types of themes that are at work. But we can identify a clear structure that movies or books within this genre follow. But then in other cases, if we're looking at poetry and we're thinking about the structure of a poem, we're going to have to talk about rhyme scheme or the meter or uh, the different stanzas and how they're arranged. So we'll explain all of that once we get to poetry. But structure really becomes important with poetry but it's also very much working in other types of literature as well. Um, again, think about the form, the form of literature. How is it built? How does it look? And how does it function? That stuff that we have to consider as well. And then we have style. Style is one of those things that's very hard to define. It's one of those things where it's like, I know it if I see it. <laughs> um, but you guys probably know, if, if, if you like movies or shows or graphic novels, your favorite director or your favorite writer has a unique style all their own. They sound unique and uh, distinctive, different than other authors, different than other directors. So everything that we read in here is going to have its own unique style, the way it sounds, uh, the kind of atmosphere that it conveys. So that's another thing that we can analyze. Maybe one author style is to be hyper-realistic, like really capturing everyday life. That's a style. 
but maybe somebody else's style is to be really over the top and melodramatic, super violent, presenting things in a more stylized way, not trying to be realistic, but sort of putting these kind of extreme touches on things to make them more memorable or perhaps more important. Uh, in other cases, an author might have a very playful, witty tone, and that's a big part of their style. They're going for humor. They're going for playfulness and kind of a light touch. That's a distinctive style that we can identify. So with all the authors that we're looking at this semester, we're going to talk about style because everybody has their own style. And you guys, as writers, you also, each one of you, will have a unique writing style based on the words that you use, your sentence structure, your tone, and your ideas and the things that you're trying to accomplish. So that's part of the fun for me. I get to become acquainted with each one of your own original writing styles. And even if you don't think of yourself as being a writer or somebody who writes well, trust me, everybody at every level has their own writing style. You need to get comfortable and familiar with your own while also analyzing the authors that we read. And then finally, theme. I think most of us know this one. Theme simply refers to the overall message or meaning of a text. So this is not the same as plot. Okay, sometimes we get these two terms confused. The plot is what happens. It's the sequence of events. Okay, the theme is what all of that means. The significance of those events, the significance of the characters and the setting and the style. What is all of that expressing to us? What is all of that telling us, the audience members? What's the message? What's the point? All right. All works of literature have themes. Sometimes they are easy to identify. Other times they're kind of hard to find, but we can always do it. Uh, and that's obviously important. If we're going to analyze text, we have to know the message or the meaning of the text. All right, so we're going to be using all of these literary elements throughout the semester. So just get comfortable with them. I've provided a list, uh, all the ones that I just covered. I've provided a list featuring all of them in the week one module. Just make sure you know what they are, you have definitions, so we can use them later. So again, if you have any questions about anything I've covered today or about the syllabus or about Web Campus, get in touch with me soon. Don't wait. And my final thing is just I want us to start thinking about literature and the study of literature as, a, a, as an academic discipline, as a field of study. Okay, just like biology or history or economics, literature is an academic field. It has been for about 100 years or so. And that's where we are now. That might not be what you want to do with your life. You might not aspire to be a literary scholar, but this semester, you are one. This semester in this class, we are all literary scholars and critics. So that's what we're doing. Uh, let's treat it with the seriousness that it deserves. And let's get ready to learn and read and write and have fun. All right. So I'll talk to you guys soon. I will see you next week in the week two lecture.